Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Edge SIG. We are so happy you had a, a chance to make it today. Uh, we have um, Mr. Ben Cushing here to speak with us today. His topic is Edge Devices for Emerging Diseases uh, Detections. Um, so we'll, um, Ben, we'll turn it over to you now. Hey there. Uh, looks like just looking at the folks on the call here, I know many of these names. Um, so, <laughs> uh, given given the the size of this, you know, uh, please don't be shy um, and interrupt me as I as I go through this. I'm going to be telling a little bit of a history lesson about some of the work um, that that myself and and the larger team had done uh, around delivering. Uh, real-time inference for edge. Uh, and we, we started that work in 2021. So I'm going to kind of go through that a little bit. And uh, I have a demo uh, to share. That's a video uh, of the actual solution that I'm discussing. And then of course, there's, this is all, this all turned into a validated pattern uh, last summer. So we can always go through that content as well. So, in short, everything I'm going to talk about today is accessible to everyone through the validated pattern uh, program. Um, currently in sandbox status, uh, and uh, I get told every week that it'll be next week that'll become support, like the fully supported one. I don't know when that actually happens, but um, anyway. So uh, my screen, okay? Like it's full screen and everything. You guys can see. I can't tell from Zoom's not really giving me that. Okay. All right, so uh, just a quick re review of where I've seen AI uh, occurring at the edge. Um, a little just, you know, refoc like a bit on the Red Hat focus. I'm sure everyone here is already familiar with those talking points, so I'll move really quickly over that, but it's just worth saying. Um, AI automation at the edge, uh, specifically for healthcare. So I'm going to talk about what it means to have automation uh, at the edge. Uh, for these healthcare use cases. And then lastly, we'll talk about the use of AI automation at the edge for uh, detecting sepsis, um, which is a very virulent and um, a deadly disease that kills uh, a lot of people every year. <clears throat> all right, so uh, as you guys all know, you're on <laughs> this, is the, it's an edge SIG, so you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, uh, you know, edge computing is pretty much changing how we do everything. Uh, I'm going to hone in on the patient, the uh, patient diagnosis and treatment section of health and life sciences. Uh, but there's actually a little bit more to that. Uh, it's not just about the uh, the actual diagnosis. Um, we'll cover a couple of those topics as well. Um, I got to be involved in this uh, work with uh, with uh, IBM a couple of years ago for bringing the DNA sequencer up to the International Space Station. Um, and for those who aren't tracking what they're actually doing, it's it's for uh, bacteria sequencing. Um, the idea being that they can create a, a bacterial culture on the space station uh, very, very rapidly uh, and figure out what that, that glop that's growing on the counter actually is, uh, as opposed to sending a culture or even data down to the ground-based systems to figure it out. Um, and uh, they're also pivoted to doing um, a gene uh, analysis, so of the actual astronauts, to look for changes in gene expression uh, as those astronauts are in zero G. So, an extreme example of of uh, AI healthcare at the edge, um, life sciences. But uh, I thought I'd bring it up because it's uh, it's my favorite. All right, so you know the common drivers we we see in the space. Uh, delivering faster outcomes. So, you know, obviously reducing latency, uh, minding the actual data gravity and bringing the, the inference and compute to the to where the data is. Um, bringing cloud-like com uh, computing and, and capabilities to all the different locations in the world and off-world <laughs> uh, that it w previously was very difficult, if not uh, impossible. And lastly, meeting uh, the sovereignty requirements for uh, any any organization, whether it's a nation state uh, or not, um, edge computing is is a very fine example of how to uh, produce true data privacy. 
All right, we're not going to, you guys have probably seen this a hundred times. Um, worth noting, the consistent experience is probably the, the biggest reason why uh, Kubernetes is so valuable for Edge uh, and, and OpenShift especially. It's because all of the things you see on the screen there, uh, we can do it like really any any part of the edge ecosystem, whether it's in the data center, in the cloud, all the way out to those those uh, end devices, uh, and that means like you know significant reduction in workforce that has to maintain the overall system. All right, so getting into the healthcare stuff, um, this slide does a really nice job of sort of sort of showing um, generally the. Uh, movement towards intelligent automation. And there's there's three pillars here. First, you have data automation, then you have knowledge automation, and then you have process automation. And the uh, the data automation really represents the combination of things, the data fabric plus the d harmonization of data uh, so that it's actually usable. It's, it's not enough to just aggregate data. It actually has to come together so that you can do analysis on it. So you can, it's computable. Um, once you have that, then you're actually in a place where you can actually see knowledge automation take place. So things like AI ML and uh, use of algorithms and big data analytics and so on. And then lastly, process automation. So really taking over workflow from human beings and, and automating their steps and their tasks. And I share this because this this approach uh, for for edge is just as valuable, if not more valuable, because uh, a lot of the edge use cases that I encounter, the workforce is actually a lot thinner, and you have less specialists that can do all of this. So the more you can apply automation, uh, the more likely you are to be successful in uh, your edge deployments. I see a hand from David. Yeah. <clears throat> can you hear me okay, Ben? Sure can. Um, this is kind of the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of you know, doing the emergency management, incident management type thing. And this kind of ties in a little bit with what I'm trying to accomplish from my standpoint, where I don't have a whole lot of, you know, medical folks on the ground or, or for the lack of a better term, the um, infrastructure is gone. So I have to basically do the same thing as you would if you're, you know, doing a you know, medical in a, how do I call it in a um, system where it's you know everything's you know, rosy and golden, whereas after an after an incident, it's all you know wiped out. So I can I can totally understand where you're going from from that standpoint, and you know yeah. automating the processes, especially from the medical standpoint, because we're trying to save people or supposed to you know save people and that type of thing. That yeah, let me sense. give two two. Um... Two extreme examples. The first, uh, emergency response. So let's say there's a flood in New Orleans. You need to stand up hospitals on the fly, like in tents. Um, if you have this kind of automation already set up, then you you can be operational very, very fast. Uh, especially when it, on the process automation front, like augmenting the way that clinicians act, the tasks they need to execute, the best practices for those tasks, all of that can be orchestrated. Uh, and so you can have like, you can accomplish with a few nurses and doctors what you would normally accomplish in a whole hospital system. Um, another example being like, you know, a war zone, right? Like, you, you know, it's a very fluid environment. Um, the, the faster systems can operate, the better. Uh, you may not have any specialists, but if you have a general medic, um, the actual system itself, like the combination of the knowledge and the process, can be a replacement for specialists in that case. Um, now, obviously, in, in the back in a more uh, uh, safe environment, probably just want the specialist, but in this world, uh, this would be a nice way to augment the knowledge of the medic. All right, so the data automation. Um, the, the Really, this is about creating like a data fabric and um, creating a, a like common layer uh, for data exchange amongst the different systems. Uh, this includes the interoperability that's necessary to uh, have different data types uh, 
uh, be recognized in the same way. So in, in healthcare, there's like 10 different ways to represent healthcare data and see it all the time, you know, whether it's HL7 version two, version three, or fi HL7 fire, or sometimes you see uh, CDAs or you see uh, claims data coming through like X12s. Like, there's just like a lot of different ways to express healthcare data. Um, and there's a there's generally a semantic mismatch that occurs where you have um, a patient who let's say has hypertension. The hypertension is represented a dozen different ways. So when you look at that patient's record from one healthcare system and you look at the same patient's record in another healthcare system, their hypertension might be represented by two different code systems. And so it doesn't look like they have hypertension from both systems, like both systems don't recognize the same hypertension. So you have this like ridiculous semantic uh, problem uh, which plagues our healthcare practices generally. It also stops data from actually flowing from like a data center down to an edge device and back with ease. Um, obviously, uh, knowledge automation is something we talk about a lot these days uh, between generative AI, machine learning, et cetera. Um, this, in the healthcare world, this represents clinical decision support. Uh, and it's said in that way very uh, decisively, we, we are not replacing clinician uh, clinicians, their decisions, their diagnoses, or anything like that. We are simply just supporting their decision-making process uh, to make them uh, better, faster, stronger. Um, the generative AI, a lot of times <clears throat> uh, these days, is being used to generate uh, patient notes, clinical notes, things like that, which are then reviewed by a clinician uh, for content and, and uh and harm, and then edited uh, based on those findings, and then published to the electronic health record, or like in the case of a discharge note, given back to a patient, so that when they leave the, the uh, facility, they have something in their hands that tells them what to do. Uh, one of the powerful things about generative AI in this case is that you know the the note can actually be written for the patient meaning it matches their language of choice, it matches their education, it matches their demographics. Um, you know, somebody who has a third level, a third grade level education is a much different consumer than somebody who has a graduate level college degree. Uh, and they will, they will get more out of that, that, you know, discharge note if it's written for them rather than for like some general uh, profile that represents them. Uh, process automation. So this is really about streamlining, standardizing healthcare delivery. Uh, again, this is super important for these edge use cases where, um, you know, we want to have uh, like layers of quality, regardless of the facility where care is being delivered, uh, whether it's inside of a, uh, you know, a, a rural clinic uh, or a forward deployed field hospital. We want the same level of quality of healthcare delivery. Um, there's also an extreme level of uh, latency reduction uh, in this case, uh, where uh, we can actually like uh, re reduce the amount of uh, transactions and loops that occur between the, the cloud host and the actual edge um, if we're able to get these process models out directly onto uh, like an edge node of some kind. Uh, automatic translation might be helpful helpful for notes. Abs absolutely, like. You know, transformer, all the generative AI, any generative AI that's like a transformer uh, is like the best use case for any sort of translation, whether it's translation of like a data type into another data type or a language into a language. All right. Um, so Red Hat, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on getting AI ML workloads out to the edge. Uh, I don't know, the slide's probably out of date. I think we actually have uh, ML model development now for edge computing, thanks to um, Podman Desktop. Um, but but as you can see, we're trying to you know check all these boxes here, uh, pretty much allowing uh, whatever persona is involved in the process of creating an AI ML workload. Um, we can we know that we can actually deliver these all the important steps in AI development across all the different. Uh, all the different edges, whether it's a data center, a public cloud, an edge, um, like a like a far edge, and I I you're gonna hear me say it like that. Like I, 
I don't consider like edge to be just like one thing. I think of many edges um, with like a central data center being sort of the the core of the apple, but all the or the the center of the tree rings, but all the different tree rings going out are each one of them an edge. And what's important is um, the the final edge is where the decision has to get made, right? Whether that it's made there because of hardware constraints or it's made the decision is made there because of data gravity or whatever, that's the edge. Uh, when we state when you say it like you know capital T edge, um, but but each one of those rings is technically an edge, all the way to the data center. All right, so in healthcare uh, we have this process called uh, of the learning health system, and the idea is that research from the field, sorry, that came out wrong, research from research institutions gets out to the field in the form of evidence into practice. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the learning health system process today uh, has a 17 year cycle. So uh, if a researcher at NIH creates a brand new uh, way to um, do like blood oxygen saturation monitoring, um, the application of that is 17 years away or the American Medical Society or American um, uh, uh, sur uh, <laughs> can't say the name right. Uh, the American Medical Society for Surgery discovers you know a, a best practice for open heart surgery. That best practice won't come into you know the hospital near you for 17 years. And that's largely because we're training clinicians on these new practices. And, uh, and it follows their, their like human education. Uh, regulation is one of those things, but, but to a lesser extent than you might think when it comes to this kind of knowledge gathering. Um, one of the powers of, of approaching uh, healthcare from, with intelligent automation is that we can bring those new best practices from research, research out into the field rapidly, um, given that the regulatory uh, compliance has been hit, that we've done the right, um, you know, clinical review and everything like that. Uh, the dissemination of knowledge is is happens much faster. Uh, and honestly, this is how we, we revolutionize healthcare. Um, and uh, this is this is ongoing. So organizations like the, the Mayo Clinic, Intermountain Healthcare, and the VA have been piloting using. Uh, automated learning health systems, similar to what I described earlier, specifically to do just this, to to uh, severely um, reduce the time uh, between new re from new research to getting it into practice, uh, which is important because, as we all know, uh, AI is sort of uh, enveloping the world, and uh, we want to have the same cyclical behavior where the best uh, capabilities are, are being deployed as quickly as, as and safely as possible. Um, and this would be inclusive of AI as clinical decision support. So this is a very, very simple diagram of how this works. But generally, you have, you're listening for new data. You are aggregating the risk factor uh, based on that data, you have a clinical decision support risk calculation. So, the which is AI driven. Um, so let's say uh, um, something like uh, stroke, right? Like what is what is the risk calculation for a patient for stroke? Uh, you know whether it's low, medium, or high. Uh, clinical decision support uh, system would then create a recommendation, which is given to a provider. The provider either agrees or disagrees with the recommendation, and then um, they take action, right? They, they follow up with the patient, they give them drugs, whatever it might be, whatever the intervention is, right? You've just augmented their practice. Um, so with that, I'm gonna introduce a patient. Um, this is Alani Lee. She uh, is a post-op for a partial mastectomy. Um, unfortunately, the uh, the mastectomy she's undergoing 
you know, the breast cancer she she's trying to recover from, it had metastasized and she has brain lesions. Um, and in order to, uh, you know, keep her comfortable and, and alive, she has to be at high doses of steroids um, to reduce that cerebral swelling. Now, um, you know, she has a very low chance of, of survival beyond five years. Um, she has decided she wants to spend those five years is in the best possible uh, quality of care or quality of life she can achieve, which is to live with her community. Um, now, you know, that's a tough decision for the clinicians because that means she's not going to be sitting in a hospital for five years, right? She's going to be out in, uh, at home uh, and with her friends and family. Um, and because she's on these steroids, her risk for sepsis is much higher because steroids generally decrease your immune response. Um, as I mentioned before, sepsis is one of the uh, most deadly diseases in the world. It's an infection of the blood, which then moves into an infection of your, your major organs, which then shut down and, and you generally die from that. It's also very difficult for humans to detect. Um, it, you know, by the time it's obvious that a patient is septic, they're like, have a high chance of dying. Um, so in this case, every minute counts when it comes to sepsis. Um, so for the sake of this use case, uh, you know, Alani's not a real patient. Uh, uh, Dr. Shane Mackney, me and I invented her. Um, and we, we upped the ante here by making her home uh, the island of Nihau, which is 153 miles from Honolulu. Uh, which makes her care very difficult, okay? So it's like, you know, she's out on a remote island um, and her her care team is literally a helicopter flight away. Um, so how does, she, how does she live at home? How does she stay at home and still receive the same level of care uh, that any one of us would see if we were living in a, in a more urban environment? Um, so what we did in this case was we uh, partnered with HPE, uh, they supplied us with an EL8000 box. You can see a picture of there right there. Uh, and we deployed, uh, this is uh, early days of, of uh, OpenShift uh, Edge, uh, uh, early days of OpenShift Edge deployment. So there was a three node architecture with a single bastion on this HPE box. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, a bunch of open source libraries that make half of that possible. and a lot of fiddling. All of this, of course, has gotten a lot easier now that we actually have productized this approach. Um, but at the time, it was it was quite novel. Um, and on that three-node OpenShift cluster, uh, we deployed uh, process automation. We um, also stood up a fire server for the data exchange. Uh, and we also trained a machine learning model uh, to detect sepsis and then uh, deployed that uh, in parallel to the other technologies I already, met, already mentioned. Now, a single box like an EL8000, you know, it's really beefy. It weighs about 50, 60 pounds, somewhere in there. And I know because I, I had to carry it around um, the floor of the sands uh, for about an hour. <laughs> it was pretty rough. Um, and uh, uh, But even with that small size, um, it's you know capable of monitoring thousands of patients with hundreds of disease states. Uh, in this case, we just were, you know, showing what we could do with one patient. Um, so, you know, way more tech, way more compute than we really needed, but certainly delivered. Uh, and we, you know, presented this uh, to hundreds of participants at HIMSS uh, in 2021. Uh, the actual data flow that we followed. So on the left side here, uh, we simulated the collection of data from uh, Fitbit, uh, pain questionnaires, uh, multiple devices like like uh, blood pressure cuffs, um, uh, uh, saturated uh, blood oxygen saturation devices, uh, number of applications uh, intended to be deployed onto the patient's phone, as well as the patient's EMR and EHR data, uh, and then you know essentially consolidated that content uh, into a fire bundle. So harmonized it, like I mentioned earlier, the data automation, and then wrote that to a fire database. Uh, fire database is a, a fire itself is a canonical data model type that's uh, maintained by the uh, by healthcare standard groups like HL7. 
Um, but there are specific ways to stand up a, a database with with Fire, uh, which you know really lends itself to a better API experience and and scaling and everything else. Um, we also had a patient viewer, so you can actually see the data. Uh, and then we are also monitoring that Fire server for any changes to it. So in in this presentation and you know ongoing demonstrations, we show. Uh, how change data capture can be targeted towards a specific uh, set of data. So in this case, we were looking at uh, changes to patient observations. Um, and there was a couple, little bit of uh, rules within that. Uh, but if if those changes were detected, uh, the specific observations around uh, blood pressure, pain, bl uh, blood oxygen saturation, et cetera, it would trigger the, the uh, capture of those specific data types that are necessary for the machine learning model. Uh, and those they would get bundled and served through Kafka to the machine learning API, uh, which that's where we had our, our model deployed. Um, and it would take a look at the data as it was collected. Uh, it was trained against 44 data points, uh, really requiring six. Uh, so we had a couple different varieties where it was sending um, you know, uh, 30 data points, 10, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but generally the accuracy was, was pretty good. Um, I, I do want to say that the, the model we developed is not for use in the real world. It is strictly for demonstration of capability. Um, it hasn't been clinically validated or anything like that. Um, and then the machine learning model actually creates a risk assessment, which is another form of fire object. Uh, the risk assessment is a a prediction of risk, okay? And that object is written back to the fire server. The change data capture system is looking for that change. And when it occurs, it triggers another event, which is to start a case for this patient. Um, if the, the patient, uh, if the risk assessment object is saying no to sepsis, then the case, you know, starts and stops. If it is detected, then it actually goes ahead and starts the full workflow of that case which I'll show in the, in the actual uh, demonstration. Uh, Jonathan, how much data can this 50 pound box consume? How much storage does it have? Good question. I will uh, send a link to the cube frame uh, setup that we, we used with HPE and Kerasoft, uh, which actually can show you exactly the capabilities of the EL8000. Um, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer because the box is very modular, so you can put lots of different uh, compute in it, depending on how how much you want to spend. Uh, and and all same deal with the storage. All right, so I'm going to do, uh, show this video with, and talk you through it as it as it plays. Um, just reminding you of the uh, you know the scary nature of sepsis and how you know the speed matters. So. I don't have to. I don't think I have to connect the dots here. Like, if you have a patient who's at in at an edge location, the faster you make a decision about that patient's sepsis diagnosis, the better. Meaning, we want to bring all of this capability as close to the patient as possible. They're in a rural location or a disconnected environment. We need all the all the capability right there next to them. Um, this actually is also applicable in a hospital. So, like, if we're streaming data from the bedside. And you have, uh, you know, let's say 400 hospitals in your in your healthcare system, and each hospital has a thousand beds. It's a lot of patients. It's a lot of streaming data across your network, going up to the cloud and back. So being able to bring all this content or capability closer to the patient significantly reduces the cost of actually executing this kind of uh, healthcare delivery. All right, changing the share, if I can figure that out. Uh, see if Zoom is kind to me. I uh, can't find the controls. Great. Um, you want me to um, get rid of it? The, um, yeah, see. can you stop the share and I'll just restart it? Um, is that possible? Hold it just a second. <clears throat> Oh, thank you, Arthur. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay.
Um, I don't start to poke around and see where Zoom put the controls. No idea. Um, which which thing do you want to do now? I I have another screen to share, but I can't I can't even stop sharing because the controls Zoom's controls are uh nowhere. Yeah, they're not I, on my they're not on my I, screens. I, yeah, if I understand. This was stop screen sharing. Do you want to continue? Okay, I'm stopping it. Yep. Did that stop it? Go. Okay. And okay. now I can select something else. Great. Okay. Uh, everyone can see that okay? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is this is how we're going to do the demo. Um, essentially, what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to be clicking on the reset button there on the top right. As soon as that happens, all the data I mentioned from the, the data gathering portion will automatically happen. So we have all that data staged, Kafka is gathering all that up and serving that to the fire server. It's going to happen very fast. So uh, unfortunately, it's, there's no way to like really slow that down. Um, and the, uh, the second thing that happens as that data is gathered is the machine learning model does its, its actual inference work and then writes the results back to the fire server the fire server then being monitored for changes kicks off a case as well. So essentially, as soon as that button gets clicked, um, you're going to see an actual <laughs> case created. And there it is right on the screen. So um, everything I just mentioned just happened, right? Like <laughs> that is the sepsis detection process uh, from you know data gather to, uh, to actual uh, generation of a case. I can actually show you the case. Um, as soon as it happens, um, you're gonna actually see the process that uh, th that we want to follow next. So not only the like process that the uh, the data gathering uh, created, but also the evaluation. So there we have the primary doctor who's now re uh, responsible for evaluating the risk assessment access. Uh, uh, the risk assessment created by the machine learning model. Um, and that primary doctor is job is to go evaluate that risk. So they would open the electronic health record uh, to take the action and, oh, there it goes. <laughs> uh, to, yeah. So they're gonna open, open up the electronic health record to take the action. Oh, and Strangely enough, uh, on this, we have a closed loop. So if they don't do it fast enough, it's actually, it, it gets escalated to the on-call provider. So I think the timer on this is 17 seconds. So, you know, in real life, you'd probably say like, if they don't get to it within a few minutes, you want to escalate the task to the on-call doctor. Um, but here we, we sped it up to 17 seconds. So you can see uh, that red box there, where it says on-call doctor evaluates risk. That's where we are right now um, because of the delay. Um, this closed loop is really important inside of healthcare, like pretty much for any task, uh, especially ones that are this time sensitive, uh, because that's how we, uh, you know, create a safety net. Uh, a lot of a lot of healthcare right now, like you know, there is no safety net like that. Um, somebody will notice eventually they didn't do something or they fit missed a follow up or whatever, and then they'll do it. Um, so here we have a, uh, this is a partner of ours, healthflow.io. They're acting as the electronic health record in this case. Um, here's the patient records. Uh, so you have, you know, clinician is reviewing the observations that were captured from the, the data ingestion, uh, keeping in mind the assessment by the AI and then making their own decision. So this is how clinical decision support should work uh, safely. Uh, and in this case, the doctor is saying, I believe this is probable sepsis. Um, and by deciding that, you know, we have to move on to the next step. If it's probable sepsis, then how do we, what do we do with Alani, right? Do we go to her, where she is? Um, is she just stay at home? Does a helicopter go and pick her up? And that decision is going to be made by the, 
uh, uh, by the licensed disposition clinician. And you'll see that in a second on the, the uh, now that we're into the risk mitigation process, so this is like a sub process, which will show below um, that uh, the licensed dis disposition cl clinicians basic function is to make a decision about um, about what to do with the patient at, you know, now that we have, you know, this probable possible diagnosis for them. Um, so here's that, that same, uh, here's that process. This, uh, now you'll see the same closed loop there. So there's an escalation pattern here as well. If the licensed provider doesn't do the disposition in time, then it will escalate. And you can imagine these escalation pro like steps going over and over and over again to, you know, different supervisors until somebody's actually acting on them. Um, in this case, there's really two decisions to make. So it's yes, arrange for patient transport, uh, or no, uh, continue the home monitoring. Uh, in the case of like, you know, pro uh, possible sepsis, home monitoring might actually be a better outcome than flying Alani all the way to Honolulu. Uh, given her her quality of life issues and and you know how unlikely it is she's going to live for a very long time, so you know to prolong her life, like her staying at home is actually part of a better pair, care plan than her having to get into a helicopter and be flown into a large health hospital, exposing her to more disease and uh, trauma. Uh, sorry, the license. Let's. Um, this is going to show the license provider actually doing the patient disposition decision. So here's the actual decision process. And you'll see you'll see the same options there that I already mentioned, which is, you know, arrange for transport or continue home monitoring. Uh, and they decided to do uh, the home uh, the patient disposition. And then here's the final. So you actually get to see we now have exactly what happened with this patient? Here's the actual audit trail of the care that was delivered for that patient, meaning we can go back and and improve this. We can improve each one of these steps to ultimately to deliver better care. Um, and it lets and coming back to the learning health system point I made earlier, if there's new research that comes out about any one of these steps, we can change the step itself. And by extension, change the way that the practice is done without having to re-educate the entire workforce. So this is a very, very powerful tool, um, this approach to healthcare. And it's, like I said, it's already changing the way healthcare is being done. Uh, and the Mayo Clinic, the VA, and InterSystems Healthcare are really pushing this forward. Uh, and so I think all of us who are going to experience this in our, in our lifetime. Um, that concludes the demonstration today. Um, so I'm just going to try to stop sharing again. There we go. Okay. I found it at that time. And I'm going to jump over to the uh, validated pattern. While I do that, uh, any questions about the demonstration or any, any uh, content there you want me to elaborate on? I guess not. It was um, a great time. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, oh yes. I, I was I was about to echo that. This is a, an awesome, outstanding presentation. I I, I think I, I just wanted to inquire about that box is where all the edge computing is being done. I mean, the data lake is there and all the HIPAA compliances on that one little box on the edge is, is handling all of that. Um. Yes and no. So it may not have all the data about the patient. It has as much data as we can get. So uh, now there's there's been some dramatic changes in the in the U.S. healthcare system in the last month. Um, the QHIN network essentially means that most patients' data is available. So given that that box has uh, you know network access, um, then we we could be pulling in 
uh, CDA documents from that larger network to provide the, the machine learning model with a lot more content than it normally would have. Um, HIPAA is a uh, is not necessarily an issue here because uh, is given that the service provider for this box is HIPAA compliant or 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 to say they've they're following HIPAA rules, then they're essentially within the um, they're 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 within the the umbrella for HIPAA well enough that they can operate boxes like this. Um, so HIPAA is kind of strange. It's not it's not truly like a comp it's not a um, you're not like certified or anything like that. Uh, HIPAA is a is more of a journey, right? You have to be compliant with the the different SOC controls, but you also have to have processes in place for the people that handle the data um, and also have well published and practiced uh, steps to take if there's a data leak of any kind. Uh, and that's actually what the regulators really care about. You know, if there's a data leak for patient records of some kind, what is your 12 hour action plan, for instance? Those are the kinds of things they do in, an, in a HIPAA audit. Um, so given that the organization that's managing this box and its its installation wherever it is they would have a HIPAA uh, uh, practice internally for their processes and their people the technology of course is the HIPAA compliance is really about the configuration more than anything else does that answer your question uh, yes awesome awesome all right um so here's the validated pattern. Uh, so everything I just showed you, uh, you can actually install yourself uh, onto an OpenShift cluster uh, using that install button right there. It'll give you all the instructions and the um, the actual Git ops has already been sorted out. So there's uh, a number of Ansible scripts um, already uh, produced that will automatically deploy this whole thing to your, your OpenShift cluster. Um, you'll see uh, there's a video on there midway down of of me, uh, Dr. McNamee, and uh, Ken Allgood from from Healthflow giving a presentation of this at Hims. Um, we've got a number of like diagrams kind of showing this in a little bit different way than what I had described, uh, but but you know I think easily consumable uh, for understanding how this all this how it all comes together. Um, the uh, yeah, here's all the actual details for actually doing your deployment. Um, now on the down here, this is the section where we're still building out content. Uh, this is really on me to get, to get this uh, filled in and contributed. Um, you know where it might matter. Frankly, everything I just told you essentially needs to get down on the page here, so I'm I'm working on that now. And uh, and there you have it. So uh, I highly suggest if you're if you're uh, curious about how this works and, and how to make it better, uh, please, you know, check it out. Let me know what you think. Um, I will share one other thing, which is that this pattern is quite useful. And uh, the best example I can provide is right here. Can you guys see that, that slide? Red Hat Team Guidehouse named Winner. Mission Daybreak. Is that coming across? Yeah, thank you. OK. So we used the, that pattern uh, to produce a uh, suicide ideation detection system. Uh, we built it in about five weeks. Uh, and we, we were one of the winners of Mission Daybreak. So this is a $20 million grand challenge to reduce veteran suicides. Um, we were able to, to uh, build this up, test it, and then validate it with the VA. And then um, we're in a phase three process with the VA right now, which is um, planning on the enterprise rollout of this solution to support uh, the VA, which I don't know if you've been following the news, has a, a really big problem with veteran suicides. Um, the uh, something like 22 suicides a day on average within the VA. Uh, and uh, reduce, reducing that even by one is it makes a significant impact. Um, so that's what I've been working on a lot over the last few months, uh, just to get that 
uh, you know, rolled out and incorporated into the VA enterprise uh, specifically to reduce veteran suicides. All right, I will stop there. Questions, comments, concerns? Um, any more questions, anyone? Um, David, you have your hand raised. Hey, Ben, as a veteran, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, I agree. This is awesome work. Awesome. Um, are, are there any any more questions? Um, I I have perhaps one last question. Yeah, I think you you talked about a um, a, a semantic um conflict. Um, that that is pretty common, and I I would imagine there there are a bunch all all within the data lake. Is that true, or how is this always ongoing thing, or are they um ever go away? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the semantic mismatch in healthcare will never go away, but there are a number of organizations that are trying to fix it. So there's the the blunt force approach, which which a lot of organizations do, which is that you know they'll they'll dictate the standard for their organization. You know, like the Mayo Clinic will say. We're only going to represent conditions with SNOMED. We're not going to use LOINC, uh, sorry, we're not going to use our um, ICD-10, for instance. That's one way to do it. Um, now, that works within your organization, but as soon as you start ingesting data from external sources, then you need to have a process for mapping that external data into the format you've decided internally. Um, ARPA-H, uh, uh, put out an RFP for this uh, earlier this year, which um, we were one of the respondents on that, uh, to use generative AI to actually translate, back to Jonathan's point, uh, to, tr to translate and transform the data into the standard that you actually want. Uh, and that that has huge applicability to addressing the data harmonization issue, given that the AI is smart enough and consistent enough to do that. Um, I wanted to share this slide here because I uh, didn't have it in the other deck and I think it's really important to highlight for any sort of clinical decision support, whether it's at the edge or in the cloud or whatever, uh, data really represents the past, knowledge represent, the, the knowledge happens in the, the now, right? And so in an edge use case, uh, it becomes especially uh, uh, acute because the the now is is wherever the patient is, right? As soon as you start to uh, move away from the patient, you're moving backward into the past and you're getting further away from a real-time decision. Um, ultimately, you're doing all this stuff to support the process that's leading to the patient's goals. Um, so if you if you find yourself talking to you know healthcare workers about any of this, my, it's my um, hope is that you start with identifying what the goals are and work backwards from that. Okay, what are the, go what are the goals for the patient population or the patient or the provider? What are the processes to accomplishing that goal? What is the knowledge that we need to have to make decisions? And then what is the data we need to support that knowledge? I think a lot of times we go the other direction and it gets really messy really fast because you're not, you're you're aimed at something in the future that's nebulous and you don't really understand why you're putting all this data together. I see a hand from Jonathan. Yeah. Um, thank you for this. Very, very interesting. When I wrote in the chat that uh, regulation is a reason why at the 17 year cycle, and you said sort of, isn't it the regulation and the approval of any drug or any procedure, you know, because of all the liability in the US. Isn't that really the reason for the long, long time it takes to approve drugs and approve devices? Uh, so, so yes and no, uh, maybe. Um, so let me give an example. Uh, during COVID um, pandemic, you know, Paxlovid was approved within a very short period of time for use by the population. 
We had vaccines that got sped up through their, their clinical trials. Even a, even a drug that's going through a full clinical trial process, you're talking about years, right? Not 17 years. Uh, device, F the FDA process for devices is slow, no question. But um, one of our partners uh, recently got their device through FDA approval within seven months. You know, these are slow processes, but they're slow on purpose because you want to, you know, increase safety and you want to improve quality and everything else. They're nowhere close to the 17 year cycle that I just described. The real slowdown in the delivery of healthcare practice and, and devices and, and interventions is the dissemination of how to use those new devices and interventions. It's the education process that clinicians go through. So it's the knowledge gap. And again, by moving more towards a process automation future for healthcare, we're actually able to reduce that, that cycle itself. So if something does get approved by FDA, whether it's a drug or it's a new device, then the clinician's education does not is not a barrier to entry for the use of those those tools. Um, the process needs to get updated itself. The clinician learns by uh, learns through use. Um, now their education is still important. They still need to go through that education step so they understand what they're doing. But the actual task that they're ex executing is orchestrated by the system rather than some nebulous clinical care protocol, which is really just a long form document. Um, automated underwriting is a really good thing to call out here, Robert. Um, uh, for the most part, that's, you know, those are all like claims data. Uh, the problem with claims data is it's all uh, lagging lagging indicators. So a lot of times company like folks get really excited when they get their hands on claims data and they think they can use it for clinical care and you just can't because claims data is just way too slow uh, for it to me me be actionable by a clinician. Um, even it is even if it is an aggregate of the patient's information. And I think we're all going to see a huge shift in that space as well thanks to this year's uh, fi new final rule uh, to move our payer system, both CMS and pr private sector payment, uh, over to prior authorization, which will require near real-time decision-making uh, for approving procedures and drugs. Um, so organizations, you know, most of the payers on the, out there and the... Um, uh, and CMS itself are going to have to change their culture from thinking in the past to thinking in the present, uh, which means changing systems to align much closer to the technology that I'm showing you. Uh, and also, in the case of Edge, they're going to have to start using Edge Computing to distribute this workload. Uh, otherwise, they'll they'll never keep up, and the the cloud costs will be uh, overwhelming, and they won't be able to scale. Um, ben, this has been an amazing um, presentation. I wanted to make sure I got a, the the link to the um, to the to the work you did for the um, su suicide link, so we can make sure we have that in in our notes. Um, this, um, Karina, do you have any comments? I was this is just uh, very mind blowing and it shows how important the edge is. Yeah, this was amazing. Thank you again. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put I'll put those two slides right here inside of the deck that I'll um, I'll make just you know sh shareable, uh, Karina, so you can distribute this to the team, and um, it's right there. There's also a press release reference at the bottom there, so that should show you like you can track that back to the source. Um, and I think this has everything everything I talked about today is is in here, awesome. as well as the the EL8000 uh, call out. Nice. I know uh, there are several people that are very interested in the device itself. Um, but thank yeah. you again. 
and would love to have you back sometime for any future work. Um, this was very insightful. Um, and uh, for everybody else, tomorrow we have a, a great AI topic since you did touch on edge, uh, AI at the edge, which is also amazing, but we'll see you all tomorrow and uh, next Tuesday for another validated patterns session. All right, but thanks everybody. Until next time. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Are you turning off the recording?